The following planners and presenters have no relevant financial disclosures. Tracy Gordon, Joseph Miller, Steve Sigmund. Andrew Darlington, faculty for this enduring material, has the following financial disclosures. Consultant, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, and Consultant, Axia Therapeutics. All relevant financial relationships have been mitigated by Piedmont Healthcare. Good morning. My name is Steve Sigmund, and I'm a cardiologist with Piedmont Heart Institute. And this morning, I'd like to talk about imaging of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Following my talk, there'll be some additional information presented by Dr. Andrew Darlington, another one of my colleagues here at Piedmont Heart Institute. I'd like to start with a case. So what is this and why is it glowing? Well, this is a cardiac PET scan with CT. You can see the heart here and you can see these orange areas that are areas of high areas of uptake of the radioisotope fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG, which is taken up in areas of intense inflammation. This patient has cardiac sarcoidosis. Note the uptake over the right ventricle, the base of the septum, and the lateral wall. So a little background on cardiac sarcoidosis. Although less common than other causes of cardiomyopathy, Cardiac sarcoidosis is an important and increasingly recognized disorder associated with high rates of morbidity and mortality, including sudden cardiac death. Primarily a systemic process, sarcoidosis generally involves the lung and lymph nodes, although liver, spleen, brain, skin, bones, and of course heart may be involved. Pathological studies demonstrate the characteristic infiltrative pattern of non-caseating granulomas in the cardiac tissue about a in about a quarter of the patients with cardiac, with systemic sarcoidosis. The clinical features are stated below. Generally, patients present with symptoms typical of conge congestive heart failure, such as dyspnea, orthopnea, fatigue. Cardiac sarcoidosis, or CS, can also present with arrhythmic symptoms, such as palpitations, lightheadedness, or syncope. One clinical feature is that unexplained heart block or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, particularly in a younger patient, can be a common presentation. Initial identification of this disorder is generally based on the ECG findings of conduction abnormalities, including right bundle branch block or complete heart block. Also an abnormal chest X-ray with the findings of bilateral hilar or mediastinal lymphadenopathy are also present commonly. This is a pathological sample uh, showing an example of a non-caseating granuloma, which is the defining characteristic of cardiac sarcoidosis on a pathological level. This was taken from the lung, and indeed most of our biopsies are obtained from lung tissue, often used with, uh, often used with the uh, uh, ultrasound-guided bronchoscopy technique. Can also be done through a mediastinoscopy as well. Here's a general concept of where that orange glowing business comes from. Basically, these granulomas are highly inf inflammatory and they'll take up the fluorodeoxyglucose, very similar to a malignant uh, process such as what you might see in lymphoma. This is an active process where the FDG, which is a glucose analog, is taken up into the inflamed microphages and lymphocytes, which are highly dependent on glycolysis via an insulin-independent pathway. So again, this has nothing to do with insulin. You inject the FDG and it simply goes into the tissue and it doesn't require insulin to take it up, which is important when we talk a little bit more about the metabolism and how to get good imaging. Both cardiac positron tomography, or PET, and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, can be used for the diagnosis and assessment of prognosis in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. PET has the added capability of being able to assess for the activity of the inflammation. PET also can be used to follow treated patients for evidence of response to therapy or relapse. At our institution, MRI is the favored method of initial diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. This is primarily due to its superior spatial resolution. In other words, you identify to uh, more definitively characterize the areas of inflammation. This allows improved sensitivity to detect and localize even small areas of sarcoid inflammation. 
as well as MRI with the ease of performance that we can do here. Quantification of degree of inflammation can be formed by measurement of specific uptake values, very similar to what's done on patients with oncological issues, such as lymphoma, of radioisotope and tissue in a manner similar to that used in oncology practice. So here's an example of a patient uh, from our, um, that we took care of here several years ago, and another example of very high uptake, mostly in the septum, high uptake in the lateral wall, high uptake in the base, in the apex, and also high uptake in the uh, right ventricle. And again, this is the right ventricle here, this is the left ventricle here, this is the front of the sternum, and that's the back uh, of the vertebra there. This is, a, this is gross pathology of a patient with cardiac sarco sarcoidosis. This was downloaded for the web, not to worry, this is not this patient. The above patient is still alive and well. Um, you can see from the pathological example, this is the um, anterior, as you recall. So you can see the highly inflamed areas at the base of the anteroseptum. And you can see some business in the septum, business meaning inflammation. And uh, more importantly, you can see the right ventricle uh, taking up uh, the inflammatory area, uh, and also a a antero apex. So this is again very similar to our uh, patient, almost identical. Here's what an MRI looks like in this very same patient, and it can really, uh, you can see how more definitive it is, the resolution is much better. You can see the exact areas where the areas of inflammation are, including the base of the septum, including the RV, and including the lateral wall. And this is, again, is the same patient that I just showed above. So I want to talk a little bit about the spatial orientation, uh, just so we can understand a little bit more about some of the images I'm showing. This is the standard orientation for all nuclear imaging, and I think it's uh, useful to go over this from time to time. Basically, uh, we have a short axis view, which is obtained from a short axis cut, and these are a process using our SPEC technique. Um, which is the single photon computed tomography technique that we use. This is not unlike uh, imaging done in MRI or echo or any other type. Here's our vertical long axis pictures that look like this. And here's our horizontal long axis picture that looks like this. And again, this is the apex up here, lateral wall, septum. This would be anterior wall and inferior wall. And of course, this would be your short axis with anterior, septal, inferior, and, and lateral. And this is how we display the images, very much like we do with other nuclear imaging. So if you look carefully, the top line is the, the rubidium line. And the rubidium is a perfusion agent, uh, very much like you're used to every day, where it's given uh, meaning in conventional nuclear studies. And it just shows where the normal blood flow is. Um, uh, it just it identifies blood flow. It's taken up by blood cells very instantly, uh, very quickly within 90 seconds, and it displays that. So this case, I show this because it represents a typical kind of case um, where it's a pretty close call, but um, you can see some decrease in perfusion in certain areas at the base, mostly in the lateral wall. The second line is the more important line, and that's where the FDG is taken up. And you can see the cavity, and you can see a very bright spot right there. And those bright spots are areas where the FDG is highly um, displayed and very inflamed. You can see the same thing on this um, horizontal long axis where it's hot here. And you can same thing, see the same thing on the vertical long axis down here. And what you'd like to see is a little bit of a difference between the rest image and the FDG image. It's a mismatch, um, very much like you see in areas of a mismatch in areas of patients who have coronary artery disease. Very, very similar appearance. This will look almost exactly like uh, what a uh, ischemic patient would look like who's undergoing viability study. So, by the way, this is an example of what just to, again, to help you co-localize things. This is the MRI, the same patient that we showed above. This is the um, transverse view and you can see very much how it matches up. So this is an example of the limitations of PET and, and why it's difficult to perform. Uh, the imaging must be formed in a low glucose milieu um, to minimize physiologic glucose uptake. The heart loves glucose, and it'll use glucose to, uh, as an energy source whenever it can. 
And to deprive the heart of glucose, at least temporarily, we use a very high fat, low sugar diet. The patients have to, con have to consume three meals of this prior to the test. And then we want free fatty acids to uh, be the a source of fuel for, for the heart. And the heart will tolerate this. So we, uh, what we do is we uh, do the low carb, very low carb diet, and the patients get a fat milkshake um, right before the study, and you can see the heart won't take up any of the um, FDG. Uh, on the other hand, if this person has a normal diet or has um, glucose loading, they'll take it up in the heart. This is the exact opposite of how we do our metabolic studies um, with for uh, ischemic imaging. So these patients must have a very strict diet, and this has been one of the major limitations of PET scanning for many, many years, but these diets have become more refined and allowed us to, to do imaging. This, in a way, is one of the slides I'm most proud of because it shows a true negative, and this is an example of a patient with good suppression of physiologic uptake. He um, uh, went by the diet, did a very high fat, very low carbohydrate for four meals, and what you can see is the myocardium is purple, now, uh, and there's no bright spots like you saw before. And I know this is confusing because of this yellow here, but this is the blood pool because the blood does circulate the FDG. Matter of fact, this is how you know that the patient got the FDG. So this is exactly what you want to see. It's a blank where you have purple where there's heart and there's, uh, the blood pool is taken up in the, uh, in the, where the blood is. So again, orange represents FDG circulating the blood stream. This is called the blood pool in a normal. Purple is the myocardium. These images are very hard to do. Again, just for a little background, this is how we do our bullseye display. This is also used in nuclear imaging and in echo, where the heart is sliced like this, and you can display a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional picture in a quantifi quantifiable way. So here's an example of what we have on our reports here. We focus in on the, new, on the short axis, and you can see an example of um, these hot areas uh, that, that correspond to relatively uh, decreased counts here. And you can see, especially at the base, decreased counts here with a hot uptake here. Not so obvious here, but these are decreased counts for PET and increased here. And you can make a bullseye up, and you can see areas, this little brown area, is the area of decreased uh, uptake, and it's quantified by a computer. And then you can see areas where there's hot uptake here, and this is called the mismatch. So we look for the mismatch, and that's really where the action is uh, in interpreting pets. Here's an example, um, another example. You can hear, here you see a very decreased area on rest imaging, but with a very hot area of superimposed FDG. And this is an example of a real mismatch. And you can see the antiseptic wall is mismatched and the inferior wall is mismatched. We can also measure the um, specific uptake value, again, very much like done, what's done in, in patients with lymphoma. And you can quantify the activity um, using this SUV value. And then when we follow up patients at six month intervals, you can often see this specific uptake value go down and even disappear. So let's talk a little bit about cardiac sarcoidosis treatment and prognosis. Immunosuppressant therapy, generally with corticosteroids, at least initially, remains the mainstay of treatment for cardiac sarcoidosis, although outcomes have been not completely validated, despite long-standing clinical practice. Implantable defibrillators are really the mainstay of treatment for this uh, disorder. And although this is an evolving area and a big area of interest, uh, more and more patients are getting defibrillators even with and without uh, symptomatic arrhythmias. One series of 110 patients from Finland receiving contemporary treatments for CHF and judicious use of implantable defibrillators found 97%, 90%, and 83% transplant-free survivals at one, five, and 10 years, um, respectively. So the prognosis of this disorder is much better than what was original, originally described years ago. Uh, and that's provided the patients get aggressive care and uh, have ICDs put in. Of note, the patients with lower EFs had worse outcomes with the transplant-free survival at 10 years of only 53%. So it is a very serious problem uh, in patients with low ejection fraction. 
We also have guidelines for ICD implantation, uh, which are available um, on the web if you want to see this. And you can see class one indications where it's recommended, certainly patients with uh, low EFs and arrhythmias. You can see class two and class three, and then you can see class three um, uh, guidelines there. And again, this is the citation for this uh, for further evaluation. Here's an example of a, a in a review we published of a patient that was indeed treated. And again, this is the actual PET CT image of a patient with cardiac sarcoidosis prior to treatment with uh, immunosuppression. And you can see that where the arrows are, and this is very hot in the lateral wall. This person had a six month course of prednisone. And you can note the increased uh, intense uptake of the FDG in the infraceptal and lateral walls and papillary muscle. This disorder seems to uh, like the papillary muscle. Uh, this is after six months of treatment and there is subsequent complete resolution of the areas of inflammation. Um, the FDG uptake present in the blood pool is normal. So again, this purple business is actually normal. And again, this is the same patient and it's a complete blank compared to what it was before. Here you don't see things in the blood pool because it's uh, graded according to where the hottest areas are. That's another principle of, of nuclear cardiology. So you'll see uh, bright areas where there's most uptake. Here there's no uptake in the heart, so the brightest areas will be in the blood pool. So this is a perfect example of a treatment patient. We've had at least 30 patients with this. So back to the patient. What is this and why is it glowing? This is a businessman visiting Atlanta who presented with complete heart block. He uh, presented to one of our internal medicine doctors who identified the patient uh, with new heart block. He's only 50. And we ended up um, diagnosing him very quickly by an MRI that was done shortly after he arrived. There was inflammation that was confirmed with a PET scan. So we know that the diagnosis was um, highly probable. The uh, patient had a pacemaker and an ICD placed. We did a biopsy on his, his well on the same admission and treatment with prednisone started. So we were able to get all this figured out very, very quickly and the ICD was placed uh, because of the, regardless of his EF based on the guidelines that say if you are putting in a device for heart block, you should put in a lead for the ICD um, uh, as well. And again, those areas are the active areas of inflammation uh, that we saw. And again, just to remind you, these patients um, are at very high risk for sudden death. And I just want to digress a little bit on this example that we saw here. Um, this is one of our early patients. And this patient actually uh, was wearing a life vest while we were doing these studies and fibrillated uh, and got a shock from his life vest about one week after we took these images. He subsequently had an ICD placed and is again doing fine and sent, sent me the cheese tray and um, a compass, which was kind of fun. So um, getting back to our next case. So, all right, now why is this guy glowing? Um, and again, this is a uh, very bright heart. And this is, this heart is, this is a, a, a simple uh, view that you would see a, on a chest x-ray. It's a chest x-ray view, and, and this is the heart, and this is a nuclear scan, and that's because this guy has cardiac amyloidosis. And this is the same image. That's him, and this is him on the black and white. And you can see that this heart is taking up this material, and that material is tech pyrophosphate. And this is a diagnostic test for cardiac amyloidosis actually to specify it's for transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. So a little background on cardiac amyloidosis. Um, this was previously thought to be a rare disease, by the way, and only recently have we been recognizing it. But it's a protein deposition disease, which involves multiple organ systems, including the heart, but also the kidney and other organs. There are two main types that we deal with. There are actually several types, many types, but these are the two clinical types. One is called the light chain type, or AL. And these are where light chains are formed. They're clonal light chains uh, formed by plasma cells. And the classic disorder is multiple myeloma uh, that causes this type of, of amyloidosis, although there's many, many other, or several other clonal light chain disorders that will cause this. 
The amyloid transthyretin uh, involves fragments of the transport protein that carries thyroxin and retinol. So it has a purpose, this protein. It's made by the liver. And unfortunately, it's one protein that can um, cause trouble because of its uh, propensity to, de to degenerate into fibrils in some patients. It can be caused by a pathogenic variation in the gene, which is called the ATTR variant or wild type. The second type is the age-related degeneration of the protein called, this is actually called the wild type. This is called the variant, I'm sorry. This wild type is formerly known as senile cardiac amyloidosis because it occurs in elderly patients. Here's a schematic of, of, uh, that I got from a review from Cleveland Clinic. You can see down here, uh, Cle Cleveland Clinic reviews. And the transthyretin is made in the liver. And in the people who, are, um, who suffer from the genetic defect or just from aging, this protein will break apart into little fibrils like this. And these fibrils are very toxic and they tend to gather in, throughout the body, but mostly in the case of transthyretin in the heart. But it can also be in the nervous system. The other type is the amyloid type, and that comes from bone marrow and from plasma cells and uh, like multiple myeloma and produce lots and lots and lots of light chains, which naturally deform and um, they're, they're proteinaceous and they also gather in heart and lung tissue and in skin tissue, by the way, and in kidney tissue and often in multiple myeloma or things like that, you will see the more classic amyloid patient that has skin changes, orbital bruising, big tongue, uh, proteinuria, kidney, those kind of things, where the TTR tends to be more um, cardiac or uh, neurologic. So that's a little bit of a clinical differentiator. This, for those who are above 40, uh, will recognize this from another atlas. These atlases are hardly used anymore, which is too bad because they're um, useful. This is back from 1978. But basically, it's a, a diagram of amyloidosis, and you can see how it scars the heart, and it involves the left atrium, and which is an important characteristic of this. And you can see the associated low voltage. And this is the classic uh, appearance of cardiac amyloidosis. So getting back to our phosphate scanning, which allows um, simple diagnosis. This is an example of a patient that is positive for the TTR amyloidosis, and this is a normal patient. And uh, there's a grading scale that we'll talk about in a minute, but this is what it, a normal person looks like. It looks just like a bone scan. Matter of fact, it is a bone scan, which is what uh, a P PYP imaging was originally used for. It's a bone agent. And here's another example I got from a review of some of the other pathologic features. Again, this is in an actual patient, but the classic finding on pathological exam is this Congo red staining with the apple green bifringence under um, polarized light, and this is a pathognomonic feature. You can also see these gray areas of this sarcoid, uh, I'm sorry, amyloid uh, starchy product uh, which is formed. And this is something that we do here as well. Uh, you can actually stain these cells, and this this will stain positive for light chain. And it's one way that we can diagnose light chain from the TTR is from the immunohistochemistry that we can do here at Piedmont. So a little bit about the imaging. This is the pro proposed imaging me mechanism, and basically by some phenomenon that's not clearly described, but it probably has to do with calcium. The PYP is very avid for these amyloid fibrils and the associated character, character, pr carrier proteins. So for some reason, uh, and this was mostly discovered as an incidental finding, um, the uh, material tech is very avid and that's where the orange is generated from on the image, it's color coded. So the more that's taken up by these calcified fibrils, the more orange it'll be. So here's a case that we had here of a patient that went on to have cardiac amyloidosis. And you can see that uh, this is a normal study. And then you can see three years later how the voltage has changed. And so this has the classic finding of the, of the low voltage feature. Now this is not present in every case with cardiac amyloidosis. Matter of fact, it's probably in the minority of cases. Most studies have it around 20%, but it is something when you see it. 
And this patient has the classic echo features of a very, very thick septum, very, very thick lateral wall, and you can see this uh, what's called ground glass um, uh, material or appearance, or speckled, uh, speckled appearance is another phrase you'll use. And it just uh, is an echo demonstration of the uh, heterogeneous nature of, of the myocardium when this inflammatory or when this scarring takes place. This is another example. Uh, this is the same patient. So this patient uh, on clinical grounds is felt to have a cardiac amyloidosis based on clinical features and echo features. And this is what he, he looks like. So very, very hot uptake. Again, this is the AP view, just like a chest x-ray. And this is the lateral view, just like a chest x-ray. These are the planar views. So who should be referred for PYP testing? And that's a very important clinical question. Right now, it mostly involves patients with heart failure and what's felt to be um, preserved left ventricular function. But now we know that there's lots of patients, uh, particularly here, that have either slightly reduced or even severely reduced um, uh, left ventricular function. So preserved left ventricular function is not necessarily a, an indication, a sole indication. Um, we worry about African Americans over the age of 60 who have left ventricular hypertrophy, and that seems to be a common finding as LVH on almost every patient, uh, particularly in the absence of hypertension. We um, also look for people with systemic findings, uh, such as neuropathy, carpal tunnel, and um, troubles with um, spinal canal or lumbar canal stenosis or other clinical features. But this is an area of intense interest because um, the clinical features are not so clear cut. From our experience here though, most patients at least have concentric left ventricular hypertrophy to some degree, and they almost all have some non-cardiac feature, such as carpal tunnel um, or other uh, peripheral neuropathy and some other non-cardiac features. But it is a tough diagnosis and it's an evolving area of interest. Um, uh, what's important, though, is it's a very common process, particularly in African Americans, where there's a high um, penetrance of the, of the gene um, it's, uh, that can cause this, and I'll talk about this in a minute. There are guidelines uh, for imaging for people who are imagers, and basically the guidelines are based on two definitions. One is the eyeball technique, where you grade the scans from zero, one, two, th and three. And a grade three scan is defined as indeed um, um, a, a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. Two is generally, one is, is equivocal, and zero, the patient does not have it. The other technique you'll see on these reports is a heart to lung ratio that's used, and you draw a circle around the heart, and then a circle around the lung, and you get the mean counts over these circles, and you come up with a ratio, and any ratio above 1.5 is considered, um, uh, a defi is considered a definition of, of uh, cardiac amyloidosis. So on the reports, you'll see both a, 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 a eye grading, a, a visual grading scale, or a qualitative grading scale, and you'll also see a quantitative grading scale. And this is done at one hour. Um, sometimes when we do get these equivocals, we will rescan at three hours to get a uh, better image. And if you want to look at these, this is on the web. Um, these are ASNAC guidelines. If you at least want to understand what the reports show, um, you can have a look at that. So here's our planar one-hour quantitative method. You can see we quantified the area over the circle here and quantified it here, and then a ratio of the mean counts over here, over here, and you can see it's definitely greater than uh, 1.5. So this is um, the characteristic th thing you'll see, as we've shown, and this is an example of a grade zero where we measure the counts here and here, and you can see it's close to one, which is normal. And then we'll also do patients at three hours because one of the problems, and you'll notice, you will notice equivocals. We do have a lot of equivocals, and part of these grade one where you see a little shadow of the heart is actually due to uh, um, counts not in the heart, but in the blood pool cavity. 
um, very similar to what you saw in the, in the patients that had the FDG scan. So early on, especially patients with lower EFs will have a collection of counts there. And matter of fact, this agent has been used for MUGA scans, which are blood pool studies. So you'll see a little shadow of this, but then you wait three hours and the shadow will go away and now you know it's grade zero. So if any of you have ordered some of these scans and have been disappointed in the equivocal finding, uh, you should know that over the past year or so we've been rescanning and we've reduced our equivocal rate a lot by just rescanning patients. So this is very important here. This is a patient that uh, was scanned here and um, there was an, a ratio. This patient did not have the TTR type. He had the light chain part. So it is very possible, even though this test is oriented toward the TTR part, you can indeed have multiple myeloma and, uh, and uh, take up the um, fibrils. Now it's not as, um, the sensitivity and specificity are not nearly as good as it is for TTR, but it is there. Uh, so that's why uh, this may be one of the most important things in this whole talk, uh, at least on the amyloid, is this statement. And this statement I put in every single uh, report. Quote, this study does not exclude the diagnosis of light chain AL cardiac amyloidosis. Patients suspected of cardiac amyloidosis should also undergo further testing for a monoclonal process with serum and urine immunofixation studies and serum-free light chain assay. So I want to reiterate this. Every single patient that we just talked about must have the light chain amyloidosis excluded, and it can be done simply through just serum and urine testing. And that's because we definitely want to pick up these, these multiple myeloma patients who have um, a very poor prognosis if not recognized right away, and they must undergo th chemotherapy as soon as diagnosed. Um, getting back to this same patient, though, this patient uh, was also actually picked up originally on MRI, and you can see the characteristic scarring pattern of an MRI, this diffuse subendocardial hyperenhancement uh, or white patches um, that you'll see on MRI. And again, this is another example. Uh, this is a normal patient, and this is the patient with the um, uh, uh, this is a, another patient, but this is the patient that had the, this multiple myeloma, and you can see the uptake of, on MRI there. And again, here's the report. Uh, interestingly, some guidelines are, are actually starting with the hematology eval even before scanning, just to you know, emphasize the importance of this. So how good is this? It turns out that it's very, very good. And this is sort of the study that got all this started. And it shows the high diagnostic accuracy of PY, PYP imaging. And just to cut to the chase, if, you've, if you have a grade three scan and you've excluded the AL patients, the ones with the light chain, then you have a very, very high sensitivity, uh, certainly above 95%. Some of these papers have above, this paper has above 99% sensitivity and um, a very high specificity as well. So it's highly, highly sensitive. The specificity is very, very good if you've ruled out the AL. So we're, we're looking at 99, 99 other studies, certainly greater than 95, 95, which is a very, very highly accurate test, particularly in the area of, of nuclear cardiology. So it's now superseded biopsy in a lot of patients um, uh, who are suspected of this disorder. So greater than 99% on some, in some studies. So why is all this important? How did this disease come from a curiosity uh, that we would diagnose and present at grand rounds or talk about when we had the rare patient, and why is it important now? Well, one is the imaging and the ease of diagnosis. The second is there's treatment, and the treatment came out about a year and a half ago, and the treatment is very efficacious. So this is a double-blind study from New England Journal, very unusual to have a true double-blind study. Uh, the patients went into this with equipoise, so we, no one knew if the medicine worked or not. Uh, and um, good number of patients, multi-center sites, um, and of course a placebo-controlled, and good follow-up. And uh, here are some of, the, some of the data from this, and this is from New England Journal. And uh, you can see uh, the survival difference uh, in these studies. But uh, what I really like is, in addition to the survival difference, which goes out several months or many months, several years actually, you have a difference in the um, walk time within the first six months. 
So the patients feel better with a six minute walk within six months or a year. And um, so for the in individual patient, we know that we can expect some benefit. And also in their quality of life um, surveys that patients take, you can see a marked difference uh, even, as, even after a year. And this is something for a protein deposition disease that was usually, which was previously felt to permanently scar the heart. So in addition to a death benefit, um, which is significant, there's a um, clinical benefit as well. Here's our experience at Piedmont. Um, you can see this goes through 19. We have some other data that goes up to 20, but you can see we're doing a lot of studies and uh, more and more and more, and going to 20, it goes up even higher. And here's how the studies are broken down. The orange are the positive patients, the yellows are the equivocal patients, and the blue are the negative patients, or not suggestive. And you can see, uh, we noticed how many positives we have here. And as a matter of fact, it seems pretty consistent. At least the ratio seems consistent. So this was something that really surprised us in a study, again, previously thought to be a very rare disease. It's still considered a rare disease. And here we have a one-third hit rate on our scan. And as a matter of fact, if you break it down, we have over a third of the patients um, referred to our community hospital are positive. And again, we are not a specialty center. These are just all comers, all patients referred throughout our system. These are mostly referred from each of our 100 doctors, or 100 or so doctors who've had one or two patients a year. And um, although most patients, um, some patients have come through the hospital, some have come through the heart failure center. And um, we went ahead and did genetic testing here at Piedmont on most patients. And again, the te genetic testing differentiates the wild type or senile from the variant. And you can see we noticed a large amount, almost a third of patients here um, had the genetic defect. Uh, 15 to 16 had the same genetic defect the valine 122 isoleucine defect, and every single one was in a, a patient of uh, African ancestry, um, either African American, Afro Caribbean, um, uh, uh, Afro European, but all of African ancestry. And usually from West Africa is where most of the uh, patients believe their uh, background was. We did notice three patients had multiple myeloma, or um, several patients. Uh, two patients on this had multiple myeloma, and they were treated aggressively with chemotherapy. Um, we have a good number of patients that weren't studied. On follow-up, though, we have a lot more patients that, that were studied. So another key feature is if you have this disorder, you, you must get genetic testing, particularly if you're African-American. And it's important because this is a genetic defect that is autosomal dominant. That means half the children of patients who have um, this genetic disorder will have cardiac amyloidosis. And it doesn't um, penetrate in every patient, and uh, penetrate meaning how many patients actually get this disorder. And there's a difference in expressivity, which is how bad of a case you get, but it's still the genetic is are there, and the patients may need uh, screening at some point. So here's one of the algorithms that's used. Um, again, these are published guidelines, and uh, they start off with grade zero, grade one, grade two. Um, you have to have the genetic testing, you have to have the hematologic testing, and you have to have the genetic testing as well. And this is a, a flow sheet that you can look at, and um, uh, these are also published guidelines that you can look at. So getting back to why is this guy glowing, this is uh, one of our patients, we now we know. We know in 2018 when we started this uh, business, um, you can see the heart and you can see the PYP where the heart is, so you know this man has it. In 19, we started doing SPECT imaging um, to further define the patient. And this patient, this is our similar layout to what you see on our conventional patients. Again, the short axis view, the um, um, horizontal long axis view and the vertical, vertical long axis view. And remember, this is not the Maya view you're used to looking at. This is, a, this is the TEC pyrophosphate. So a normal patient would have nothing. This, would, this screen would be black. And now here we are in 2020. That's the same patient. 
He ended up getting genetic testing, which was positive for the variant. He's African-American. He's now in treatment to, to, with the famitis. His family's been screened. One child has a disorder and one child doesn't. So now we've learned a lot about uh, this patient and his family. Um, although this study mostly, or this discussion mostly pertained to the sarcoidosis and amyloidosis, there are other um, um, infiltrative cardiomyopathies. One is Fabry disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease, and this will also cause a, a, a scarring pattern, and it's, it's not that uncommon. We've seen here, some here. This is an example of a patient from here, and they get a characteristic lateral wall scarring pattern of uh, late gadolinium enhancement. Here's a normal patient. So that's one of the other infiltrative cardiomyopathies that's out there. There's also many, many others. So uh, thank you very much. That's an overview of our, of our infiltrative cardiomyopathies. And I um, just want to reiterate, reiterate how important it is that uh, really everyone works together uh, in the diagnosis and treatment of these patients. This is something that the clinical cardiologist, the cardiac imager, the electrophysiology doctor, the heart failure specialist, the pulmonologist, radiologist, all have to work together. Every one of these patients has had a discussion with every one of those doctors uh, to come to the best treatment plan for the patient. And pathologists will often include them as well. Hematologists are involved in almost every patient as well. So it's one of the real multidisciplinary areas of interest, both with sarcoidosis and with amyloidosis. Thank you for attending Cardiology Grand Rounds. This concludes my portion. I'd now like to introduce my friend and colleague, Andrew Darlington, who will be talking to us a little bit more about the approach to cardiac amyloidosis at Piedmont, and also to provide us with some additional data. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I wanna spend a few minutes here at the end of this discussion on amyloidosis, telling you and filling you in a little bit more in regards to what we're doing here in 2021 in the diagnosis and management of cardiac amyloidosis. I'm Andrew Darlington. I'm one of our heart failure cardiologists at Piedmont, for those of you that are not familiar with me. But uh, what I want to spend a little bit of time on here in the beginning is just a little bit of data on the technesium pyrophosphate scan volume uh, and outcomes at Piedmont Heart Institute. What you see here is the technesium pyrophosphate study results at Piedmont Atlanta over the course of the last several years. And we've had the opportunity to scan 274 patients to date. And you can see the breakdown of patients that have tested positive, equivocal, and negative. So uh, pretty remarkable. We have about a 25 to 30% positive hit rate uh, for patients that have been scanned uh, at the Piedmont Atlanta campus since the beginning of 2017. Now, when you look at the individual subtypes of patients that were scanned positive over the course of that time, there were 80 positive scans. And you can see 18 um, patients ultimately have pending genetics. Three patients, uh, I'm sorry, yes, three patients uh, ended up testing positive for light chain amyloid, but the rest you can see 26 ended up having TTR wild type, and even more had the V122I mutation, the most common form of hereditary TTR amyloidosis in the United States. Uh, at least at the Piedmont Atlanta campus, that are testing positive for hereditary TTR from V122I compared to wild type. These are the technesium pyrophosphate scan results from Piedmont Athens over the course of the last several years, beginning in 2019. And there have been a total of 69 scans that have been done uh, at the time of this presentation, of which 29 of them ended up coming back positive um, highly suggestive for uh, TTR cardiac amyloidosis with 25 equivocal scans and uh, 15 completely negative scans. Now, when you look at the rates at Piedmont Fayette, the third campus location, we are doing technesium pyrophosphate. Um, also since the beginning of 19, we have done 56 scans of which 16 have ended up coming back positive with just one equivocal and 39 negative scans over those 56 uh, total tests. So expanding from that, how do we actually improve patient identification? This is the barrier that we all face. 
And what we've done at Piedmont Heart Institute is we've done several things. Number one, we've instituted a cardiac amyloid order set, which went live in mid-December. And it really allows one-stop shopping to help facilitate the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. And you can see uh, this can be accessed through the EPIC EMR. And by typing in just dot amyloid, you can see the laboratory tests that are pertinent, whether it's the light chains, immunofixation, uh, imperative biomarkers, such as the natriuretic peptide levels and troponin, but also the imperative imaging, um, ranging from echo to MRI to of course, the technesium pyrophosphate scan. And there is also a smart text notification to the user to remember to perform genetic testing for our index cases so that we can help tease out between wild type and hereditary TTR. In addition, is the built-in referral pattern on the order set. So once the orders are uh, at the order set is accessed, tests are selected, then the option is to actually refer to amyloidosis providers within the Piedmont Heart Institute system whether it be myself on the south side of the city in Fayetteville, Noonan, or at Samsky, Drs. DeMoss, Krishna Murthy, and Singh, and of course, Dr. Marty out in Athens. I mentioned that if you want more information in regards to how to access the order set, it can be found on the guides and tip sheet um, in the EPIC training um, website accessed on the village itself. In addition, and also accessed on the village, is a little bit further information on disease awareness. And this has been generated as of 2020 and, and is available, as I had mentioned, on the village to help um, providers make the diagnosis in timely fashion. And this includes red flag symptoms, the actual algorithm to work up a patient with suspected amyloidosis. Um, all of these things are built into this very simple disease awareness program that has been published once again available uh, on the village for our, our providers um, across the system. Beyond disease awareness and diagnosis comes the ability to do research trials and enroll our patients uh, in the research spectrum here at Piedmont Heart Institute. And historically, we've had several trials that have been available to our patients. Um, out in Athens, and Dr. Marty, the attribute cardiomyopathy trial, which has since closed, looking at AG10, but also the ongoing and active trial, um, looking at the Leica compound um, uh, gene silencer in the trial Cardio Transform. And these patients uh, are, are being enrolled as we speak at both the Piedmont Fayette and Piedmont Atlanta campuses. And I think this is very important uh, for an amyloidosis center to not only be able to offer top-notch care when it comes to the management, but also uh, allowing our patients the opportunity to, to enroll in research trials to gain access to cutting edge therapies. So I just close with this, and, and this is a quote by uh, Sir William Osler, and he really states that to study the phenomena of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea, while to study books without patients is really to go not to see at all. And, and what I really mean by that is that we need a knowledge base to be able to make this diagnosis. And I hope that ultimately some of this uh, that we're doing at Piedmont will help with that. But I think as well as having the knowledge, the book, so to speak, is the experience that goes along with the uh, identification of a disease process. So that combination, I think for our providers will go a long way to diagnosing this disease process and offering treatment in a timely fashion. Thank you very much for your time. If uh, there is any concerns or questions down the road, I hope we have the opportunity to collaborate um, moving forward and making the diagnosis for these patients and, and ultimately managing them over the course of time. Well, that concludes the end of my talk. Thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with both Dr. Sigmund and myself. We look forward to collaborating with you in the future in managing from a diagnostic perspective to management for this uh, very important disease population. Thank you and have a great day.